welcome F5 community to This Month in Security. I'm your host, Aubrey King, and this month I'm joined by Aaron Brailsford. None of these things should be exposed to the internet, but the fact that there are 54,000 SLP instances on the internet currently exposed strongly suggests that a number of these are exposed to the internet. I'm an Amubine. And just one thing, don't wait for it to happen. Because I, I get cases, they're just like, oh, we're under attack, help us. Do you have any DOS protection? Oh, no. <laughs> Malcolm Heath. How many rounds of this cipher do we need to go through before we can statistically prove that the output appears random? Sander Vinberg. And that's a whole different discussion from how do I train the model and what does it do? That's, that's literally linking up the numerical output with a specific decision. And David Warburton. Because like with so much of technology, things just get easier for the end user. It becomes turnkey, just like driving cars. How many of us know how to really service our car from the ground up? Strap on those earbuds and get ready for This Month in Security. In this month's episode, I'm going to actually catch up live with F5 Labs from the conference in San Francisco. We're going to talk to you about everything that we saw, all the new industry trends, as well as some gadgets we saw on the floor. We've also got a segment on the talks that Labs gave at this year's RSA conference. Rather exciting. And we'll dive in a little bit on the details of both of those. In addition to that, I also catch up with Aaron Brailsford to talk about the news with a new colleague of his in the CERT named Amina Mubin, who will be joining us next month for a bit of an interview. First up, let's get to the hottest stuff. I'm going to talk to Labs about RSA. Check it out. I mean, who would like to start with this one? I mean, we all saw some cool stuff. What, what was your... Well, for me, this was my first ever RSA. Me too. So it's been quite a big event because it's my first time here. A lot of not quite sure what to expect. I would say to me, it's something that's been quite revered in terms of all the different security conferences. So I've been very much looking forward to coming along. I think for me, one of the biggest takeaways, aside from just the sheer number of people that are meeting around, is just how many talks and topics are involving neural networks and machine learning, artificial intelligence, and with some pretty quite surprising kind of use cases. It never seems to cease to amaze me just how many different ways people are finding to take machine learning, not just generative AI, but all, all forms of LLMs and apply them to different aspects of security, both from an offensive point of view and defensive as well. It's funny, like I, I sit here and I think about the, the term generative AI and I, I find myself counting like how many times did I hear the word generative today? <laughs> Every single day. Like, and then I think back to like two years ago, how many times would I hear the word generative? on any given day. I mean, not just that, but this was the year where we stopped using the word machine learning and we started using the word AI, mm. right? Yeah, and that's, that is very much, I think, due to the influence of ChatGPT, this was the year where where kind of AI kind of came of age. And that's like, that's reflected in what you see in the, in the conferences everywhere. And when I was up on stage getting ready to, to speak yesterday, there was this, this guy in the front row who I'd never met, but he knew a bunch of people that I knew as well. And he was kind of heckling us a little bit. And he said, oh, you guys screwed up. You didn't put AI in your title. What are you doing here? <laughs> and that, that kind of like says everything you need to know, right? Yeah, it, it did. You're right. It seemed like there were a million things titled with AI. I had a funny thing happen that I didn't anticipate. I figured everything would be AI, kind of like you said, and, and you guys have experienced. For me, it could just be the assignments that I had while I was here, but I, ta I talked to a lot of SSL companies and I asked them specifically, how do you see AI impacting your SSL industry? Or will that impact how quickly you can work with FIPS in the future or any of that stuff? Nothing. They, they had nothing to say about AI in the slightest. It was all about quantum. That was nonstop. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that makes sense, given, <laughs> given SSL's kind of place in the OSI model and, and given the importance of cryptography for SSL, like that, that would make a lot of sense to me that that's what they're worried about. Malcolm, um, you sort of talked about the use of ML with yeah, testing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because this is the first RSA that I've been to in a very, very long while. And if, if you'll indulge me for a little bit of a story, the first time I came, I really wasn't finding very much that I wanted to go see, but I found this sort of like crypto track that was actually in a different building than the rest of the conference at the time. And that was like the perfect place to be because I really had no idea what these guys are talking about. This was like maybe 
15 years ago or something like this. You must know what you want at a conference, right? But that's exactly what I want at a conference. <laughs> I want to be in the room where I'm like barely able to keep up with what's being said because that's like the best way for me to learn. In this particular talk, which is the first one I went to, an academic researcher had been studying how crypto systems can be assessed for their security. NIST, for example, has a suite of automated tests that they'll run against a, a proposed cryptographic algorithm, in this case, Block Cipher, to try to see whether or not they can sort of, I guess, sort of experimentally verify that it is, in fact, secure in some particular way. In, in this particular way, it's how many rounds of this cipher do we need to go through before we can statistically prove that the output appears random. This guy had applied a neural net to do this in a very interesting way, which I mean, it, it's quite detailed, but essentially this was, this is, this is the thing that I'm the most excited about when I see all of this stuff about ML and AI is all the people who are applying it to very specific problems and, and getting really, really good results. This, this guy was able to say that it, well, his system was able to detect elements of non-randomness in the output several rounds after the NIST tests were detecting it. Right. Interesting. So that, and that's, and because the NIST tests are like 140 tests or something like this, he was able to essentially make connections between the individual bits in the output and see whether or not they were related to other bits in the output and at a, at a really kind of massive scale. So that was really exciting for me. It's funny, right? Because that to me is an example of creativity where it's like when you take away the, the onus on the human to sort of apply this this kind of, I mean, because because a lot of what we're talking about here, this is kind of brute force computation, mm -hmm. but, but at a level that demands a machine learning model. So, I mean, really the word is creativity, right? We're mm -hmm. seeing a huge, huge uh, kind of efflorescence of creativity in terms of just people saying, what can I do with this thing? I <laughs> exactly, just, exactly. Like, they, they just drop this to them and what can I do with it? And what we've seen this week is, we can do a lot of different, really, really fascinating things. Yeah. You mentioned creativity. I saw Kevin Mandia today and he was talking about zero day attacks and how they compare to the attacks of 2002 through 2019 that he saw. He said during that time, a, a huge percentage of the attacks they covered, Victim Zero was always spearfished. And he mm -hmm. was saying yeah. that now, just because his supposition is that we've just gotten better at spearfishing and understanding it. And my mom can see it sometimes. And it's, it's, it's just a, a, a little bit, it took us 17 years, but we finally figured it out a little bit. So now it's all creativity. Those guys are seeing like one one day and more zero day. Like zero yeah. day is so creativity, right? The attack I was talking to you about, yeah. he talked about in his talk. Go check out his talk. I think that's recorded the keynote. But that was a very creative attack. Yeah. So he yeah, was, it, it's, it's a lot of time, right? A lot of change in a really short period of time. My favorite one so far, <clears throat> keeping on the kind of ML and AI track, was we spoke briefly the other day about the use of, so it combines the two favorite topics at the moment, AI and, and encryption. And so fully homomorphic encryption or FHE is kind of coming along slowly. For those that maybe aren't too familiar, and I'm by no means an expert, the idea is you can perform operations on encrypted data. So from a privacy point of view, it's fantastic. You can send entire workloads and data to, to cloud environments, potentially, perform operations on them using their systems and their compute and their resource, and benefit from never having to expose a secret key and then the risk of exposing data. So it's fantastic. And you can do some basic kind of operations on, on FHE encrypted data, but it's they're being typically quite slow, quite cumbersome, quite computationally heavy. And so the talk I saw yesterday was combining machine learning with operations on FHE encrypted data, basically. And like the use cases are really exciting and really fantastic. The, the couple of examples that were given were taking images that you could say encrypt on your mobile phone, for example. And you could send this encrypted image to some kind of cloud service. It could perform an operation, apply like an image filter, never seeing the original image, and then send it back still fully encrypted and never having seen the private key. And you could decrypt and see that image with the filter applied. And similarly with text, they can perform like sentiment analysis. So they can say how people do, for example, have done with Twitter, just getting the kind of vibe of, of certain tweets or tags. Again, they can do that on fully encrypted data. So the idea that we can then 
this is going just even beyond creativity, the fact that there's now very real world use cases and genuinely enhancing security and privacy by combining things like FHE and machine learning is, is really exciting. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I mean, there were plenty, certainly plenty of talks and topics that were non-AI based. But one of the keynotes I saw, I think on the Tuesday it was, was around the identity crisis, the living identity crisis, and the role that AI is playing in that. Talks of things like creating identity fabrics and the fact you would need AI to be part of that to help make decisions based if you're trying to deploy a zero trust architecture or perform some genuinely least privileged based access, getting to the point where you would need depend on AI because of the amount of decisions and context and and really small decisions that need to be made very rapidly, you would kind of need to rely, rely on a system like that. I think there's a really, really excellent example about applying these technologies in very specific use cases, right? Because one of the things that these newer ML systems can do very, very well is detect anomalies over time, right? Yeah. And that is just a key for any kind of zero trust architecture, right? It's like when, once you get into the behavioral end of it, of, of that kind of design, yeah. you have to have some means of being able to determine if a, an actor is, is behaving in the way that they usually do, or if they're deviating from it. Yeah. And I saw actually a, another really, really good talk about using ML, again, <laughs> and graphs to d detect lateral movement within environments by attackers which was doing this exact thing, right? Yeah. Because if, if David logs in to his computer and then he accesses three or four resources during the day, and most of us probably have a relatively limited set of things, right? Well, this, this person was actually using log data from a Windows server to detect over time through the log files, the point where an account was compromised and an attacker started using it differently. Yeah. And detecting that as early as possible because the attacker wasn't logging in and checking their email and then I don't know, going what seeing what was on the lunch menu or whatever. It yeah. was immediately pivoting over and starting to like scan or or try to go after a domain controller or something like that. So I do wonder, I think this is possibly intimated during this kind of keynote as to how AI can help make decisions around zero trust because one of the tenets of security is this is least privilege. Only grant the very minimal privileges and access and resources that someone needs to do their job. And one of the really interesting stats that was shared was around about 95% of identities or users, generally speaking, only access about 2% of the resources they're granted, which is insane. So 98% of the resources have been given and they just aren't used or shouldn't be used. And so you kind of wonder whether AI can then make decisions whereby the default access for someone is, is nothing, maybe, or very, very minimal. And the AI helps make decisions in real time. Do you actually have access to that? Okay, maybe I do, or maybe you do. And then it, it kind of forms a configuration change to give you access. So I can think of about half a dozen resources that I that I use no more than once a quarter, mm. right? Because there's some precipitating event, like or oh, it's 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 time to go change your 401k contribution or whatever, right? Yeah, right. That, that happens like once a year. Mm. We were in the <clears throat> cloud console the other day, and it's like mm -hmm. so we had six thousand five hundred access permissions, right? right. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not resources. Right. That's that's actions, yeah. but still, yeah. We I had forty seven permissions that I used, and six thousand five hundred permissions that I never used, right? So that kind of tells you everything. Yeah, you know. exactly. Uh, did you guys get a chance to see the floor much? Some the show floor, the, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Floor. I must admit, I haven't yet done the entire ride. It's a big show floor. It. <laughs> I got to say, the one thing that I saw that just blew my mind was it, it was like straight out of a sci-fi thing. And I, I guess I can say it, IBM, right? I, I don't know if you stopped by their booth, but they were talking about using AI to map your threat surface so that you could have an understanding of what was there, automated scanning and things of that nature, and knowing what patch levels and things like that, everything's at. But the coolest thing about it was how they access the data. And it wasn't like mouse, keyboard, mouse. It was this thing there was a pillar that was there. And to access your data, which was up on a big screen, you pull, which enlarged everything they, on the globe. They had all the threat service mapped to the globe. Wow. And so you pull it up, you spin the globe around, and you're doing this with your hand. So you're just- That's very minority report, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was totally. so nuts. It was exactly- That's, that's, fine. that's amazing. <laughs> and clearly inspired by a minority report, yeah. but it's real, like right. looking at that come to life is, is kind of neat. It makes me wonder <laughs> how many years it will be before we start pulling back from AI or rather start re-evaluating and maybe we've realized in five years time or so that we've maybe gotten over-reliance or dependence 
and uh, we need to start injecting a bit more humanity back well, into it. You've already got people fighting it. I mean, yeah. as many times as I heard the, the word generative, I heard the word Skynet. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, it is hard to be fair though, and it's it's hard not to sound like you know we're kind of blowing smoke or going too far, but it's hard to to see how you cannot have some element of AI in both your defenses. Well, I say both. Hopefully, you're not attacking, <laughs> oh, but there'll yeah. be elements on both sides, right? I mean, Definitely I think AI is unfortunately going to become sort of table states. I mean, if you have all these different, really creative attack methods, and, and Sunny, you were talking about, I think the use of AI to find zero days, yeah. just using ChatGPT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can you not have AI help in the defense when it kind of opens? You know, so many possibilities. This kind of goes back to what Malcolm was just saying about ML for really specific functions versus not that ChatGPT is is general AI, right, or mm -hmm. uh, AGI, but but it is it is sort of a, a large language model just for the purpose of generating language, and then we are the ones who are figuring out to do with the language, right? Yeah. But but it's a it's 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 not generalized artificial intelligence, but artificial general intelligence, but it's sort of it's not for a specific purpose other than creating human language stuff, right? But for me, the sort of thing about designing a model where the greatest amount of creativity comes in is how do you take the, the numerical output, which most of the time is, it's, it's like a classifier. It's, like it's telling you which number is bigger or it's telling you if a number is gonna go up or it's mm -hmm. forecasting a number. And then what do you do with that to answer a specific question? You know, and, and so, like classifier functions, like nearest neighbor functions are often telling you sort of something that is closest to an archetype or a template that you have already defined, right? And so so the the act of training ML and determining parameter weights and all that stuff, that, that is difficult, not necessarily an outlet of, of sort of insight and creativity. If anybody's an AI expert and they disagree with me, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but... <clears throat> But it's it's sort of that to me is the moment of insight. And you and you're like, I have this this theoretically infinitely capable thing. I need to solve a really specific problem. And how do I take the, the output and make that meaningful to me? And and so all of the applications of ML that I've seen that are the most inspiring are when people have come up with a really creative way to use this thing that is kind of a brute force tool, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's really like we wouldn't have the AI explosion that we had right now if it wasn't also about the expansion of the computational power and yeah. all the data that we have for training. Um, mm -hmm. And so so it's like that that kind of moment of, of not just defining an operating point for agency, right? And that's a whole other thing is like there are, there are ML systems or AIs that have sort of been given agency to the point of saying, do I give access or do I not give access? Yeah. And that's a whole different discussion from how do I train the model and what does it do? That's that's literally linking up the numerical output with a specific decision versus that same exact AI could be generating a trust score and then there could be a human agent that is supposed to interpret that trust score and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to go allow yeah. you to access that resource. Yeah. In scale, in the zero trust architecture, that would work. You couldn't have a human agent Make it like interpreting that, right? So then this is a case where it would it would not make a lot of sense. But do you see what I mean about sort of mm -hmm. the difference between what the ML tells you and then what we allow the ML to actually do? Yeah. Kind of two different questions. That's an excellent question, and I think I think that one of the things that I heard actually quite a few people talking about is, do you apply an an ML model as the sole determinant? Yeah. For the thing, or or do you use it as one of many inputs along with quote unquote more traditional controls or automation or what have you. And I and I think for myself at least, when you are dealing with certainly access control, but but anything that could really impact a human in a serious way, you need to be extremely careful what you're yeah. doing, right? And I would say there has to be a lot of fail safes and checks and so forth. And I'm not I'm not a at the point. Testing, yeah, yeah. A lot of testing. Because a false positive rate that is that is not insignificant is something that you really need to consider. We've spoken before, Sandra, about the, the idea that even if, we, I think generally we've said that a lot of people, most people in IT, specifically in security, are going to need to become at least conversant and, and have a rudimentary understanding of AI. <laughs> Not to the point of how to train models and so on, but just to appreciate how they work, why they work the way they do, the limitations. Because like with so much of technology, things just get easier for the end user, becomes turnkey. 
just like driving cars, how many of us know how to really service our car from the ground up? Probably not many people, right? So, and as with all these tools get kind of infinitely more complex, and we kind of just trust that these boxes, all these virtual boxes do what they say they're gonna do, I think it's gonna be really important that people just have at least an appreciation of, of the way they work, not at a super low level, but how they're trained, the limitations, the fact that they might generate false positives and, and so on. Yeah, and, uh, and a lot of that is, is this like balance when you're developing a model of overfitting or underfitting, right? And you, mm. you, can, you can train a model to think that it is always just repeating the exact circumstances of the training data. It's an overfitting scenario, right? And, and in a security context in zero trust architecture, I mean, it, it sounds like you're either gonna fail open more often than you want, or you're gonna fail close more often than you want. Like, both of those errors are big problems, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like if we're failing close all the time, and the AI is saying no, then we're, we just made a really, really advanced way to be the Department of Health. Right? And that's, that's <laughs> yeah. not good, right? So it's so yeah, easy. Right? And we were just talking about two steps forward, two steps back, right? It's mm -hmm. like, if we are stupid with this thing, we're gonna undo all the advances that we just gained. You, you just made me remember, I, years ago, I worked at a, at a place that had a data center that had a secured entry or whatever, and it had one of those hand geometry readers. Uh -huh. And for whatever, no, no, I'm sorry, it was a fingerprint reader. And it worked for every single member of my team except me. <laughs> Never worked for me. And and I, we actually had the guy come out, the person who was supposed to be maintaining it, and he, he, they tried a bunch of things. And what eventually they came to was like, you don't have enough blood. <laughs> I was going to say, how did you dry? The, the, yeah, the, the, the quick thing was only hand cream to just kind of, you know. Yeah, I could not get it to work. <laughs> so we we eventually got one of those hand geometry readers because that worked. Okay. The full hand was good, just not just not the just uh, not, not the fingertip. But actually, if you're if you have an overfitting model, right, and you're essentially going to be like, this is the most common case. Well, Malcolm doesn't get in the data center, yeah. right? So you know. yeah, yeah, they they only train with people with. Just max blood. <laughs> max blood. All of blood. <laughs> and very, very moist hands. I don't know, right? So one of the things I thought you said, Sam, was really interesting was this kind of concept, your perception of the show was what you just mentioned, like two steps forward, two steps back, and that kind of, that growing gap. Can you explain better? Because I'm doing a really yeah, good job. Yeah, it was interesting. I I feel like concepts, because I've been at I've been at RSA, Every year that they've held it for the last five years, meaning I've been here four times because we didn't do it in 2021, right? And I feel like frameworks and concepts of which I think the MITRE ATT&CK framework is the best example that were kind of considered niche or esoteric every other year that I've been here. Now people are just talking about it. Mm -hmm. People will sort of drop it in a talk and not explain it and move on. And I'm just thinking, I mean, you guys remember two summers ago, I was talking about the minor DAC framework and I spent half my talk just explaining yeah. how to interpret it, right? Yeah. And, and it wasn't just that, it was also kind of people talking about CVEs, which obviously I've been spending the whole week talking about that. So on the one hand, I was really kind of hardened and I feel like systems like this that I felt probably should become a de facto standard are kind of approaching that. And more and more people are embracing these systems that, I mean, they're not just well-designed and really granular. They're also very good for making sure that we're all speaking the same language, mm -hmm. which is a big problem in security, mm -hmm. right? So on, on that respect, I feel like I see some progress and I'm, I'm stoked about that. And then the flip side is that I've been to a lot of talks where the conclusions are, are talking about like defense in depth and inventory and visibility. And I'm thinking- Just the basics, basically. Just the basics. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. like, that, that's, those are prescriptions that I was making four or five years ago. Yeah. And, and those are prescriptions I was hearing from people four or five years ago. And that was also what I got trained in when I got into security like 12, 13 years ago. So mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like this, this RSA has been really good. And there have been a lot of talks that I've been to that have been good. There have been a lot of talks that I wish I could have made that mm -hmm. seemed really good, but it's not DEF CON, right? It's not, it's not the hackeriest security conference in the world. And so it's a little hard for me to assess, is this because RSA is so focused on sort of making sure that people are also addressing the business challenges and the sort of the reality of security operations? Or is it because the field is just always getting bigger and so there's always a demand for the basic stuff? I don't know, but there were there were times where I would hear people talking about these things and I would say, yes, two steps forward, and then I would hear the basics. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, man, I don't know. So it's a little hard for me to assess, but, but I do think it's been a good conference and, and I'm looking forward to having more talks tomorrow. I was saying to a friend of mine earlier today that, that there's at least four different sort of cybersecurity worlds, uh -huh. right? There's there's like RSA, which is which is really heavily focused on people with titles that are a lot higher than mine, the strategic initiatives, 
corporate governance overarching themes big stuff yeah. big high level stuff and a lot of vendors right too I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. that vendor floor is crazy it's enormous and incredibly loud it's and packed, packed this year right? um, and then there's the hacker scene and then there's the academic scene yep. which is a whole different ball game and, uh, and I think I had another one that I'm now forgetting but at any rate I think that this being my first time in RSA for quite a long time I was actually coming into it. I'm much more comfortable at a hacker con. I, this is really not my scene, but I actually really enjoyed myself. Yeah. Like I saw a whole bunch of people who were really trying their, their level best to, to get educated about things, to share their knowledge. I saw lots of people who clearly have long-term relationships with each other, lots of friends, mm -hmm. networking yeah. and contacts and stuff. And that was really heartening to see because that's honestly the exact same things that I like about a hacker con. It's just the topics are different, really. Yeah. Speaking of the vendor floor, if I could be a little provocative for a moment. There were a couple of vendors, not, not a couple, there were many vendors that I saw that were all about insider threats. And I gotta say, oh. I sort of think that threat is maybe a little bit overblown. Either it's overblown or I don't know the depth of it. Kevin Mandian said 1%. 1%. 1% of oh. what he's got. <clears throat> of successful breaches were because of insider threat. That is a very different statistic than the one that was being floated for years. That's more consistent with what I would think, right? Yeah. And, and I don't want to downplay it because when it does happen, it's really, really damaging, right? It's a, that's a hard threat to detect. Yeah. It's a it, really hard it, threat to deal with. I just walking past some of these vendors and people are like, oh, do you know? And they throw out these kind of stats. And I'm just thinking like, every org I've ever worked at, every breach disclosure I've ever looked at, I was analyzing publicly disclosed breaches for years. And I was generally seeing single digit percentages for years. Yeah, I remember reading some of the, the breach research that you were doing and, and what I what I kept seeing was a lot of times anything that it was it wasn't a malicious insider. It was like an insider who had made a mistake. Yeah, had, tons had, and tons of accidents. Yeah. Tons absolutely. of stuff like people emailing a wrong attachment to the wrong person. Right. Mm -hmm. And and eventually we realized that we needed to it wasn't that we we changed the category, you just changed the wording in the category mm -hmm. just to say malicious insider and accidents because yeah, it was, it yeah. was fuzzy. I think to your point though, I think, I mean, I, I was going to make a comment about, I, I don't, I'm glad I'm not on this side of the fence. I'm glad I'm not having to do the research and talk to a, a hundred different vendors and, and try and cut through all the FUD and the marketing. Oh, um, you mean you're glad you're not shopping on the vendor? Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. because it must be, be overwhelming, just the yeah. sheer number of vendors and, and solutions and overlapping solutions and do you go point, do you go cross, it's, yeah. it's overwhelming. Yeah. But to your point, I think that the one thing that is, is hopefully helping will be things like frameworks and standardized kind of language, so that there's some, at least some consistency in just the language we're using and how we're talking to people and conversing. So many things to wrap your head around there in RSA. Let's change gears a little bit and catch up with my buddy Aaron Brailsford for some of the most recent events in cybersecurity this past month. DOS is pretty much all for the lulls. That's what I've heard anyways. Speaking of DOS, I was curious, Amina, have you ever worked on a DOS attack that involved the service location protocol? I have not. You have not? <laughs> well, interesting. Because it's my understanding that there is, and for you youngsters that do not know the service location protocol, I think that is a protocol that comes with your AARP card for you guys. That's a retired Americans benefit organization. That's the, the top shot on the, the current events. Yeah, Aaron? Yeah, so this, it is a vector for an enormous amplified DOS attack. Right, they're talking about ampli amplification factors of, of over 2,000 times. So that's like send one byte, get 2,000 bytes back it, toward your target. You would achieve that, right, by spoofing the source of IP on your traffic to the SLP server. And then the massive response goes back to your spoofed IP and, and takes someone else offline. And high amplification multipliers, very sought after because they make volumetric denial of service much easier and less costly on the part of the person who's, you know, needs to rent the botnet to do it. But that wasn't really what interested me. What interested me was that this is a 2023 CVE, right? It was disclosed on April 25th, thereabouts, in a protocol that has been around since 1997 and very rarely pops up have essentially no business being exposed to the internet, right? It's, it's, a pro, it's a protocol from a more naive time, 
when security wasn't a thing, it has no inherent security. You shouldn't have it on the internet exposed. But the researchers that, that discovered or reported this amplification vector found something like thousand or thereabout exposed systems on the internet. What are these, the last remaining Windows ME machines or something? Uh, <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I was like, why? Why are there so many? There's a bunch of products that have this exposed by default, right? That their product listens on the SLP port. Here we go. Konica Minolta printers, Planex routers, uh, IBM's integrated right. management module, VMware ESXi hypervisor. None of these things should be exposed to the internet. But the fact that there are 54,000 SLP instances on the internet currently exposed strongly suggests that a number of these are exposed to the internet. And every time this happens, and, and don't get me wrong, we've been impacted by this, right? 2020, CV 2020-5902, and we suddenly realized that there were a, a large number of big IPs with management interfaces exposed to the internet. Every time this happens, I wonder how we haven't learned that lesson. Right? Why is all this stuff still listening on the internet? I, I get that organizations have huge networks, vast estates of things, of, of devices, end client machines, printers, fax machines, scanners, all of this stuff. It works over TCP IP these days. Boy, blue teamers beware. Just man, set your honeypots to this port. <laughs> How as a world are we still apparently this bad? They're keeping control of our assets. Yeah, and well. in this instance, what's the worst that can happen? You are a, an unwilling participant in the denial of service attack. It's going to consume your outbound bandwidth. It's going to be probably a little bad for you, but much worse for the poor fool that's on the receiving end of all of your SLP responses. But if all of these things are exposed, what else is exposed? If those 54,000 hosts are Konica Minolta printers, what else is exposed on those Konica Minolta printers to the internet that could be vulnerable and it's a route into these organizations? We really need to get better as an industry at keeping stuff off the internet. We see it all the time with our quarterly security notifications, right? It's like, why is your, your management on the internet? And there still are. I mean, we still have third-party groups that go out and, and assess how many big IP management ports are on the internet. There, there's still plenty out there. So yeah. if you're out there and you're yes. running management on the internet, please stop. Yeah. And I, and I get that with some devices anyway, the it's, it's easy to accidentally blow off a toe, right? If you deploy stuff in the cloud, it's frighteningly easy to accidentally shoot off a foot by leaving it exposed to the internet. But on-prem stuff, like printers and routers, right? These are hardware devices. There are fewer excuses, I think, for that being exposed to the internet by default. One of the things that kills me about this one, you said was the multiplier. That was like a 200X, you said, roughly? 2,000. 2,000. 2,200 times. <laughs> this made me think about one attack vector that I've always kind of drooled over, and I'll put it out there just because I haven't seen anyone attack it yet. The same kind of thing, right? With a crazy multiplier, but this was only 80x. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only, only 80x. Napter and APTR. And just getting back to the spirit of DNS, right? I didn't know what this thing was at all before I jumped into a mobility network. And then essentially the idea is it, it's like a PTR for end user devices. So, like, it'll tell you what capabilities are available via DNS on the, the person you're trying to call's cell phone or your cell phone. So it does a lookup, what is available, and it, it gives you data about not only the device itself, but also the tower's capabilities, where it is. So the idea is simple. Oh, and the user's plan as well. So by doing one simple DNS request, you can get an understanding of what's available to communicate with that end user device at any given time. Typically, there are 80 responses per <laughs> single query, and you're talking one byte request to 80 responses. Oh, my gosh. Like... I kept yeah. thinking, like, if we could find that, some hacker finds that on the internet, open, <laughs> they're buried in 5G networks, but gosh, if, if anyone configures a DNS server intentionally to run Napter, that could be a big attack vector. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's my Team Red advice. <laughs> there you go. If you think about, there are 54,000 instances of 
open SLP instances on the internet. They all have an amplification factor of 2,000 times. I think <laughs> I've reached yeah. a point where basically everybody has a pretty big upstream. Corporations, anyway, private internet connections, maybe not so much, but corporations have large symmetric connections because they're pretty inexpensive. Then that's a lot of amplification you can very easily source against the target. It's no surprise that volumetric denial of service attacks just seem to keep getting bigger. Yeah, and I'm gonna do you know like roughly how big of a volumetric attack you've seen since you've been at this? Five gig? Uh, yeah, there was one uh, yeah, about about that range. Hundred. Biggest one I've witnessed is eighty. I had a customer that had four one hundred gig pipes in and they put AFM in front of the whole thing. Watching an eighty come in and take down nothing was Nice. You know, you're like when last mile shines, you don't always have that opportunity for last mile to be really great. But in that particular instance, it was fantastic. Yeah. Now, we, we also had another, I think, looking at time, we got another one for Lazarus. Yeah. This one, I, I love it because Linux malware, you don't often hear that. You really don't. You do not. So this one was from Lior's This Week in Security, I think, which was last week if you don't follow this week in security this week in security is available on community.f5.com check it out there exactly Uh, thank you for the plug lazarus have been around for a while this one caught my eye two reasons one was the the way that they were delivering malware to people is via fake job adverts pushed to people on linkedin and we all know there's a lot of i'm going to tread lightly here there are a lot of people on the job market right now in tech everywhere. And that means there's a lot of people out there who are potentially hurting and struggling and trying to desperately to find a job, right? The more people on the market, the harder the job market gets for people looking for a job. It's a low blow, I think, to start going after those people, but they did. And they're using social engineering, which is the oldest trick in the book to have their victims download malicious files, which are binary executables. Um, And the things that are interesting about that part of this whole thing, one is that they're Linux malware, right? And and that's highly unusual. Windows everywhere. Mac, pretty prevalent. Linux, you don't hear about. In terms of like targeting people, Linux malware that spreads across servers, right, is everywhere. Mirai, for example, being one of the most widely known botnets that self-propagates and is on, you know, all sorts of exposed servers is different. It's written in Go, which is also starting to gain popularity rapidly for writing both offensive and defensive tooling. And it uses Unicode to give itself a fake extension. So what he said saw were PDF files, only they're not PDF files because it doesn't end in .pdf. It's a Unicode dot or it's a unicode character that looks like a dot and they're obviously relying on people unwittingly double clicking those and the fact that they're actually an elf binary it then executes as opposed to it being an actual pdf that reminded me so i haven't seen unicode in file names pop up in research in a while but it reminded me of something from probably 10 years ago which is the unicode right to left override 2011 so that's that's a long time ago now 12 years time flies so the unix right to left override is another way of achieving the same kind of end of hiding the real extension of a file name uh, there's a unicode character that when you get to it it literally switches the order that you know print the characters so you can have something that was let's say in windows looks like it will say something like i don't know invoice xc but in actual fact, it's invoice cod.exe. And because of the swapping of the order, when you look at it in, in Explorer, it looks like a dot dot. But when you double click it, Windows knows that it's actually an exe. It's going to execute it. Similar thing. And I hadn't seen that in a while. So It made me think about when I was kind of a younger Linux admin. One of the things that I used to love doing was anytime you know, I would hear about a piece of malware or a virus that hit our exchange infrastructure or whatever. I was using, at the time, Pine. 
because I wasn't cool enough to use Mutt or Elm, but I would use Pine to download my Outlook mailbox and just take the pretty much anything that I did. It's in there. All right, I'll download that attachment, run strings against the binary and pipe it to less so that I can see exactly what this thing is going to do when it hits my machine. That was one of those things that I used to love doing. So I guess knowing that there are a lot of new Linux people out there, I'm on Twitter. I see all these new Linux communities. It's great to see. It really is. But my advice would be go back to that old way, download your stuff and then inspect what you're downloading. Don't double click a PDF. Even in Linux, I guess, is the moral of the story for me. Don't trust anything you download is good broad advice, right? Ever. Don't yeah. trust things that are sent to you unsolicited, whether it's email or LinkedIn or, or any other delivery mechanism. They come from people you know. Like if you're not expecting them, and even if it comes from someone you know, give it a second look, right? Because compromised email accounts happen or spoofed emails, although that's less prevalent with now anyway than it was say 10 years ago and yeah very suspicious when when we get sent files so one of the things that i deal with is external researchers right so these are people that we don't know and that we're not expecting an email from who will routinely email us stuff and it could be a report that's legitimate or for all i know it could be malware so we have to be very careful about what we do with stuff that comes in on the shed, thoroughly inspect it, open it in sandboxes, that kind of thing, to make sure that what looks like a PDF is A, a PDF, and B, is not a malicious PDF, because those also happen, right? PDFs or Word docs that exploit functionality of, say, Adobe Acrobat or Word. We saw that not so long ago with the Office vulnerability the name of which escapes me, but that was essentially amounted to XML external entity references in the doc file format that could be abused to go and fetch external content. Those things are real and it's very hard to protect against those. I wanted to add from support and search perspective regarding DOS attacks. Uh, just one thing, don't wait for it to happen. Because I, I get cases there, they just say, oh, we're under attack, help us. Do you have any DOS protection? No. So have it, please yeah. have it in place. And and one more thing, don't, don't, I mean, a lot of people use automatic learning, depend on automatic thresholds. Just, okay, do it for two weeks or so, but then go to manual, put something solid and then it should be better because otherwise the system works in mysterious ways <laughs> if you don't understand how automatic learning works. So yeah, if you have lack of understanding, please don't use automatic, use manual thresholds. And another one would be, don't wait for us to tell you to take a packet capture, <laughs> take a packet capture when yeah. there's an attack. Packet captures tells us a lot about what's going on on your network. So that's my tip from support. You know what? So the automatic, the automatic, like the policy builder type stuff, especially for thresholding for me, where I found that to be so problematic was especially on responsizing, mm. like expected response from a URI that was tricky to get. And if you're a customer out there struggling with it on AWAF, it is worth your time to go through this and actually set these limits. Yeah. Absolutely worth your time. Why would it be worth your time? Well, you don't want, first of all, false positives. If you've got something out there that is 500 meg that could be downloaded through a particular URI. Well, you want to make note of that, but you know you probably don't have a 25 gig database that is going to come out of that URI. So <laughs> yes. you lock down your sizing and yes, that's exactly the idea. And, and I agree with you hundred percent. To me, the automatic thresholding thing seemed like a great idea to get started. And while you're running in transparent mode to understand Absolutely. your settings and to understand your environment, yeah. Don't set like your production values based on that. Do that manually. Simply, I see people run into time and time again is that someone falls under attack and then they turn on DOS protection in automatic mode, right? And that's the first yes. thing it does. It learns the baseline. And the baseline it learns is under attack. So it, it just goes, everything's cool. Like, this is normal. It's, like, it's the only time it's ever seen any traffic. What the three things that I think make ESRP instance easier for us, well, from my perspective anyway, customers who already have, say, AFM or ASM, 
And even if it's not fully configured, it gives us a product that we can leverage visibility of what's going on in their network. So customers who have some kind of external monitoring and, and then the understanding of what baseline looks like, yeah. which you can only really have if you have visibility into what's going on in your network. I think I was under attack. Okay. What does normal look like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard for me to tell you if you're under attack or not, right? Because I I don't I don't sit in your company. I don't look at your systems every day. As I said, we'll be catching up with Amina a little bit next month, but we're gonna finish up here with a bit of a chat about Sander and Ben's talk on the CVE process and its evolution, as well as a sneak preview. Well, not anymore. But at the time, it was a sneak preview of the Capture the Flag event that we're hopefully going to be working into a Dev Central event in the near future. Check it out. Yeah. So talk about frameworks. How was the talk? No, it was good. I don't. I don't always come off of a talk feeling happy with it, but this one went really, really well. And I think a lot of that was just down to go speak with Ben. <laughs> he is super, super knowledgeable, and quite comfortable on stage. He does a lot of public speaking, right? He and I have spent a lot of time working together over the last six months. And so it was it was one of these things where we, we had a lot of trust in each other, which allowed us to go up there maybe with a little bit, I don't want to say less prep, but less scripting, right? So we could go up there and sort of trust. We both knew the content. We both knew what we wanted to say and, and it felt really natural. So yeah, I had a great time. One of the most fun talks I've done in a really long time. Got some really good feedback from the from the crowd. So um, I think for me, that's you always know the good talks are when <clears throat> or you could always forget the content. It's the, it's almost more the people on stage when they're relaxed. Yeah. You know they know their content. They're not forcing it. And there was a lot of it back and forth between you and Ben, which was which is unscripted and mistakes, if you want to call it that. But it just added to the, the fact that. Ben and Sander worked together really well, presented together really, really well, and the talk was awesome. It went, it went really well. The, the room was packed. Yeah. Loads of great feedback. Really packed. Yeah. And for, for a topic like CVEs, which is, I guess, in some ways harder to maybe apply that kind yeah. of report to a specific, right, go and do this thing to fix all your security problems now. Actually, people loved it. And yeah. there was like, really great actions and recommendations from Sander and Ben. So yeah, it was great. It worked out really well. Yeah. Yeah, I feel good. I like the way that you guys sort of the back and forth also, although for me, I had a heads up. I mean, having just done this month in security with you guys, yeah. it was like, oh, man, this talk is going to be great. I guess that's, yeah. that's why going into going into our prep meetings to get a little meta here behind the scenes for the community. I was telling my team this is going to be a great talk. We got to definitely cover this one. So um, again, the, the other thing for me is the work that Sander and Ben have done it isn't a standalone single piece of work. I mean, to some extent, the report is, but actually it ties and feeds in really, really closely to the work Sandra and Mark have been doing with the SIS series that we've got on, on the site. And it just keeps building. And it's been a really great addition to that. And I think the work that Sandra's done in this report is going to then help feed into adding additional context and improving the SIS series. I thought the state of application stuff that you added in there, it was really pertinent. Yeah, that's yeah, that worked out really, really well. And to David's point, there was a lot of this when I was looking, uh, looking at the, the content we had and, and I was just thinking, well, I mean, the data science is phenomenal. The visualizations that Ben created are phenomenal. There's a lot of interesting stuff here, but it's not exactly game changer stuff in terms of applicability. And so once I read the SOAS and I, and I sort of slept on a little bit and digested, and I thought, well, this actually changes how you look at all these findings, right? So but it was, I mean, to, to your point about, about all these different projects feeding off of each other, just going through when Ben first sent me his initial findings, and then we sort of refined that and turned it into the report, and then we refined that further. There's a ton of stuff that I learned that I didn't know. The best example is just what he said about CWEs. All CVEs are supposed to have a single net CWE. That was news to me. I had looked at so many CVEs that had two that I thought that it was supposed to be a many to one. And when I only saw one, I was like, I guess they just got lazy. <laughs> so literally, Ben Ben told me that, and he, that was in one of the weird things. And I was like, oh boy, I probably should have known that already. I probably read that somewhere in some CWE training thing. But yeah, so so I learned an enormous amount just in the process of doing that. And then what we can do in the Sensor Intel series, also talking with them about EPSS and joining the EPSS special interest group. Like it's been a very the last six months for me have just been nothing but bones, yeah. and it has has paid off. I think in a really, really interesting way. And one thing I really liked watching the talk was that having read the report, I appreciate it, really liked it, but I still seem to learn more just watching you and Ben deliver it. Mm -hmm. Certain things I think sometimes just 
reading or having something delivered in a different format medium works really well. And the one thing I picked up on was the overlap with the word OSP and top 10, how that's changed over the years and just how many CVEs the OSP top 10 accounts for. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, both the, these, these different measures of how many CWEs go into each of the categories, and then also the plot of how many CVs go right. into each of the categories. And those are the two plots that Ben was the most excited about. We, we sort of beat this, this point to death, but how hard it is in that system to differentiate between changes in the threat landscape, changes in the tax service, and just procedural noise, yeah. right? human-generated noise in the system. And I don't mean that as a criticism of OWASP in any way. But we've been talking for years about how OWASP was designed for a rather specific purpose. And, mm -hmm. and it's sort of been dragged into all these different realms and used for a bunch of different things. We've got them bumped and the report back up to the top of the homepage on our site. Nice. Just make it a bit easier for conference attendees and people that maybe missed the report when it was first out. So hopefully if anyone hasn't read it yet, they can go and catch up. Definitely. And, and obviously we'll put links on the video. Now how about tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm really excited about. Yeah. So tomorrow is, so Malcolm and I are delivering our API CTF. So I think what's what's really interesting about this CTF for me is that it's very much for beginners. This isn't for CTF pros, it's not for those pro hackers and, and uni students that can literally travel the world competing and, and earning good money. This is just what do you need to know about API security. And we could deliver this in a, in a slide deck. We could give another 30, 40 slides, but actually, <laughs> It's just another way, like I said, about the report versus the presentation. It's another way of engaging. And I think anytime you can get hands on, it's just more interesting. Yeah. Plus, stuff tends to stick better. I think in security in particular, and as somebody who has a very sort of theoretical approach to a lot of things, there were a lot of things that I had to learn two, four times, and they would only half stick. And then I just tried it a couple of times. Yeah. So as somebody who is resistant to hands-on learning for a long time, I mean, it took me a while in security before I realized that that really is just the best way to yeah. do it. So. I mean, I, I remember my first CTF, which was actually an F5, it was an internal F5 event years ago. And I nervously went in just as I was getting into security, went to my first CTF. And again, it was a friendly environment, just internal F5ers and absolutely loved it. It was just so much fun. I really surprised myself how much I could do just by poking, prodding, and applying a little bit of knowledge. So anytime I get a chance to run something like this, I love it. So we're fully booked tomorrow. Yes, very cool. That was exciting. I gotta find a way to sneak in. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Somehow. We should give a shout out to Sean Backer, right? Oh, absolutely we should, yeah. The original Sean. developer of the CTF, yeah. and if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here, right? So yeah, yeah, it was thank a you to fantastic Sean. Fantastic idea from Sean, and, and yeah, thank you very much. I had a really good time rewriting a little bit of it, updating some of the challenges, also sort of polishing the Chrome a little bit, if you yeah. know, right, you know, making it shinier. Yeah. But but yeah, the, the, the core work was shown, and, and we're really, really happy to be able to present it to this, to this big audience. Yeah. And I think that, just from my, my take, I've always done best in learning things, probably anything, but definitely security, when it's been fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I've been engaged and interested and curious, right? Those are the motivators that I have. And I think events like this, even if they can be also very frustrating when you can't get it to work, and then you get the one flag. I've done a whole bunch of CTFs over my career where I've gotten one or two flags <laughs> after like eight hours. And those one or two flags really mattered though. Yeah. Yeah. They were great. The, the, the technical roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly, right? We're really excited to present it and I think yeah. it's gonna be great. We do make a point with this one as well because we want it to be, again, we're not doing it for, for prizes and, or anything like that. It's literally yeah. educational. So what we do is we give people a certain amount of time to compete do what they can and then we take them through it all at the end so even if you sit there and really struggle and get maybe one or two flags or, or nothing else you're sticking to the end you can watch us take you through it and, and and learn even if you can't do much by yourself and then we're going to take some feedback after the event and hopefully stay tuned or looking to possibly put up to github and and open it up so that not only are we going to hopefully carry on contributing but the community as a whole yeah do. is that something we can maybe run for the community on dev central 100%. The one thing we want to do as well is not just host and run it for people. We're always happy to, but for people to take the code, whether it be the containers or the config, and actually run it for themselves mm -hmm. as is, or add it and change it to each other needs. So yeah, 100%. That's we've put it out there. This isn't really isn't a way to promote F5 or Labs. It's really to give something back and to help educate. And if people are happy to take it and run it by themselves, then fantastic. Jason Raman, looking at you, buddy. <laughs> so okay. But I mean, Sanders Talk, for example, is recorded. I'm not yeah. sure how and when it's going to be live, but people can go and watch the recording online, I presume, is mm -hmm. the thing that RSA do. 
won't be happening with the learning labs, but equally, like I said, we'll put it on to GitHub and, and, and Docker Hub. Yeah, yes. exactly. We've often left these things up for at least a little while after yeah. an event, just to let people continue to play with it. I, I could very easily see us doing something similar for the Dev Central community. I think we need a Dev Central special edition. Yeah, I'm at happy. Some point. So yeah. Let's work on that. Yeah. Thanks for watching this month in security. I'm Aubrey with Dev Central, and if you really enjoyed it, don't forget to click like and subscribe. Maybe even leave a review if you listen to it on podcast version. Hopefully we'll see you next month and have a great F5 day. Oh.